Coming up on Regarding Men, Parental Alienation and Lying Feminist Farrah Khan. Hello and welcome one and all to Regarding Men, where we hold men in high regard and where red pill isolation comes to die. And we like it to die a very, very quick, flaming death, as you can see <laughs> on the screen, courtesy of Tom. Um, we're going to be talking about parental alienation today, but first I wanted to make a, a brief announcement about Regarding Men when we add a new group to our list of services. We like to talk about that a little bit. And Mike Buchanan, the founder of Justice for Men and Boys and the Women Who Love Them in the UK, has started a group for men who want to give up the bottle. A noble effort for some of us. I think a very good thing to do for many men. And you can find that group at Regarding Men on Saturdays at 12 noon Eastern time. 5 p.m. London time for those of you in the UK. And Mike also has an accompanying website, menstopdrinking.com. So you'll find a link to that below if you want to go visit that. And you can also join Regarding Men and attend those groups. Anyway, on to our topic for today, which is parental alienation. For those of you who don't know, uh, that is a rather large problem in our society, given how many acrimonious divorces happen. And one of the things that happens, and I can tell you from my work with men over the years, that a regular theme over and over again, when men seek counseling during the process of a divorce, it's what to do about the fact that she's turning the kids against it. Yep. Happens all the time. It's a tragic thing. It's very destructive to the child. We know, for instance, that every psychosocial measure by which we register the, the well-being of teens, adolescents, young people, children, is affected negatively by father absence. Uh, it's, there's no disputing this. Uh, there isn't really a debate to be had about it. We have a, established through research a causal relationship between things like teen pregnancy, drug use, truancy, criminality, go down the list of uh, suicide, everything you can think of that can possibly happen in a kid's life that's negative is aggravated by father absence. And one of the one of the causes of father absence is parental alienation. By the way, this happens. Men do this too, alienate children from their mothers in the rare cases that they're given custody. That sometimes happen. We're not saying that this is a, a specifically a men's issue. Right. Uh, all I can tell you is that anecdotally, it happens a lot. And I see it over and over and over again. We hear about it in the groups of regard men this is a very real problem and it was finally acknowledged to some degree at least at least in Ontario where the the mayors of Mississauga and Brampton that would be uh, Bonnie Crombie and Patrick Brown respectively tweeted out their celebration or recognition of parental alienation day calling attention to the problem very very positive development in that because there has been a great deal of feminist resistance to the idea of parental alienation. There has been attempts to sat, to discredit the research that proves this. We'll get into to some of that. But what happened when, when, this, uh, when these tweets came out is there's an individual, uh, Farah Khan, as you can see on your screen there, and she tweeted around this. This is a, an employee of Ryerson University. She's a professional feminist there. I forget exactly what her job title is, but her, her, her duties were essentially to carry on a feminist narrative and to promote it throughout the campus and outside the campus. Well said. But she tweeted the following. The concept of parental alienation is often misused in custody battles driven to divert attention away from allegations of child abuse or intimate partner violence specifically men's violence against women. Why are elected officials uplifting this issue in a misguided manner? Well, mm. gee whiz, where to start with this? One, as we said, and we have the research to back this up, 
this isn't just a men's issue. This is an issue that comes up in divorces and custody all the time. Um, I think the estimates of the frequency of it, uh, honestly, are underestimated. Uh, yes. I see this a lot more than uh, the research would indicate, uh, at least anecdotally, uh, but I can't prove that, so I won't stand on it. But what I will say is that to try to frame this, parental alienation is just a false allegation for men to cover up their abuse of their families isn't just sick, it isn't just wrong, it isn't just mean-spirited, it's downright destructive. And ultimately that mentality, I believe, causes harm to children. If we don't take parental alienation seriously, I believe we're harming children. And you think about it, what happens? The child experienced life through both parents, the marriage doesn't work out, and all of a sudden one parent is forced out of the picture. Can we, is there any kind of universe in which we can imagine this doesn't cause harm? Mm -hmm. uh, just the absence of either parent. Uh, but specifically, since we know that fathers are responsible for so much of what, what brings adjustment and well being to the lives of children, the removal of fathers is particularly damaging. And this woman seems to be targeting that as trying to create some sort of mythology around that idea. Mm -hmm. um, and in our efforts to name and shame hateful ideologues that perpetuate lies mm -hmm. that ultimately harm the lives of children, we're here today discussing this. So I'll throw it out to Tom and Janice. What do you guys think? Yeah, she's a feminist dinosaur. You know, I mean, they've been doing this for years and years of just only focusing on the victimhood of women and only focusing on the men being the perpetrators. And um, it used to be, Paul, at least I remember it, you know, years ago, 10, 15 years ago on the internet, that's all you saw, you know? But now they're getting fewer and fewer. So it really looks like she's a dinosaur. I mean, saying things like this are just, it's just people looking at it, they shake their heads and say, what's wrong with her, you know? Well, part of it, I mean, if you look, if you go through, and we'll provide the links, you can look at what this woman actually does for a living, what she's been recognized as doing the awards, even though she has, we've been able to find no credentials whatsoever on, on her to give her any kind of, you know, credibility as an expert on, on these topics. Yeah, Paul. Her whole narrative, her whole job uh, is dependent on the victim narrative for women. Mm -hmm. um, so I think she's just simply covering her her employed ass. Well, that's her um, credentials. Yeah, is she's a is woman her. and she's a victim. Yeah, that's, that's all that's she sad. needs. It, it's it's really <laughs> I I find it just so distressing to see this is a woman like tens of thousands of other women employed at universities all across North America and indeed in the Western world who collect very large paychecks and have wonderful, secure jobs with massive benefits, all sorts of time off to spread the narrative that women are innocent victims and men are perpetrators of violence and sexual violence in particular, uh, that all public sympathy should solely be directed towards women as well as all public monies, all public programs, all special rights and privileges. And when she sees this issue, her mind obviously immediately goes to the concern that this might take away some of women's special rights and privileges, specifically the, the special privilege that women have in family court to um, obtain sole custody of their children, to make allegations unchallenged, to paint their children's father as a perpetrator of abuse. And this worries her that, that you know, there might be some awareness of the fact that parental alienation is a real problem and that it is, I think, primarily perpetrated by women because of the situation that women are the ones who are often given custody. And this is a way that women gain that kind of custody by alleging <laughs> that their ex-husbands were violent. And it's, I think, very interesting that she, you know, she immediately moves to talking about men's violence against women. She's really not very interested in the condition of children and children's well-being. And we see that exactly. so often in feminism, even though the rhetoric of feminism 
is about the protection of women and children. It's really about female power, female power to control narratives, to control reality, to determine whether the father of their children is going to be able to see those children on what terms under what conditions and according to their say so and so this is what she's getting at here and it, you know it is it's disgusting that i'm sure she has really no intimate awareness whatsoever of the realities of parental alienation yet she feels that she can pronounce on it in an authoritative kind of way whereas you know according to the council for shared parenting uh, some degree of parental alienation affects, they estimate, 3.9 million children right. in the United States. So let's not dismiss this as a minor issue. That's three times the number of children who suffer from autism. And yet she's minimizing it and other feminists piled in on this announcement by Patrick Brown to, to make the same kinds of statements and to engage in ad hominem attacks saying that, oh, you know, all of these people who are interested in parental alienation are just men's rights fanatics and male supremacists, etc. Immediately Patriarchs going on the attack patriarchs yeah exactly you know and 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 none of them know anything about the reality uh according to the council of of for shared parenting again there are thousands a thousand articles talking about uh the the evidence the the legal evidence the scientific evidence this is a real thing that there are diagnostic criteria this is not simply an, an excuse that men use in order to deflect uh, allegations of abuse in most cases of parental alienation I mean one of the the diagnostic criteria is that there is no former evidence of abuse and then right. suddenly then right. the child is being alienated because the child is being told toxic things usually about the father so that the child comes to believe the father has abandoned the family that the father doesn't care for the child the father never loved the children you know etc and the, the the one parent usually the mother poisons the child or the children's minds against their father and it's a terrible thing i too know many men who have suffered from this the the oh psychological and emotional trauma experienced by those men and by their children is tremendous and for this woman to turn it into a uh, you know an issue of feminist control immediately to attack it with no real knowledge i'm sure about the reality uh, is all too common and uh but you know very disturbing very disturbing indeed well, and that's how you you know for me <clears throat> that's exactly how you get people how she gets people to align with her without exercising any critical thinking the first thing you do is create a threat narrative right. this is about protecting women from abuse right we know that in 90 percent of the population there's a there's a knee jerk oh women are being abused, she must be right, we must side with her, uh, it, because no matter what, we can't have women being abused, uh, even if it means that children's lives are forever damaged. Uh, yeah. We have to give it a pass because it's it's falling under the umbrella of poor, oppressed, abused women. Uh, by the way, I want to give a shout out to Junior Witter uh, and a thank you who sent us this story. Uh, thanks, Junior, and thanks for all the work you're doing there on Facebook to raise awareness about parental alienation. It's really important work. And, you know, when I co-authored Say Goodbye to Crazy, that that book uh, that I wrote with Tara Palmatier is targeted at women, actually, who are the next relationships of men who are dealing with still acrimonious, hostile, conflict-ridden uh, ex-wives. And over and over and over again, I heard from these women, and still do, get emails from women, yes, his ex is still, he hasn't seen his kids in three years, he hasn't seen them in four years, yep. they'll no longer speak to him, yep. they write once in a while and ask for money and then they, they'll never visit and they treat him with disrespect they they start mimicking the abusive mother in these situations and this happens over and over and over again it is devastating to the <clears throat> bond it's devastating to these children who suffer the consequences and ideologues like Farrah Khan are out here trying to peddle this as as mental health. It's it's really, really unfortunate. 
Yes. And you know, the thing that gets me too is that <clears throat> this whole thing has to do with relational aggression. I mean, all of parental alienation is literally relational aggression on steroids. And, and that's where women tend to have more practices than men. It's interesting, they talked about in the uh, literature, they say that the um, parental alienation behaviors are not reciprocated by the victim. Isn't that interesting? You know, they, they over and over again, they say the same thing. Paul, my experience is the same as yours. You know, the people I've seen over the years, it's almost all men who've been alienated. You know, I've seen one woman who was alienated, but she is a minority by a long shot. So I'm sure I have a biased sample, but uh, that's just my sample to report, you know. I do too. I, I'm sure I have a biased sample, but that's what I see over and over exactly. again. And yes. the, the dilemma that a lot of these men face, at least when they come to me, is how do I handle this with the child? How do I talk to them? Because they're very hesitant. They won't repeat the mother's behavior. And in fact, they're very hesitant to even be honest with their children about what's going on. Exactly. Uh, because they don't want to fall into this, oh, don't ever badmouth their mother routine. Right. Uh, they're scared of that. And they're scared of what damage it might cause to their children. Exactly. And I think a lot of times their inaction actually aggravates the, the problem. This is a, a, an issue that has to be fought carefully. Yes. Uh, because you can't drag the child into the battle exactly. uh, between the parents, no matter what. So I understand why they feel like they're, you know, between a rock and a hard place. Uh, but at times and at, at age appropriate levels, it is important, I think, and I have suggested to many men that they sit down and just have an honest discussion with their child if they're old enough, you know, to process this information. Uh, but it's a tough place to be in, and it's it's a hard call to make at any given time. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I just want to second that because my experience with men who've experienced this this really devastating situation is that they are they feel so trapped. They want to reestablish a good relationship with their children. It's very difficult to do if the children are are refusing to communicate, refusing to see them, which often yeah. happens. And uh, or if they are seeing them, but they're feeling that, you know, the relationship has been poisoned by lies that the mother has told about them. They don't really know how to how they can counter those lies without seeming to attack the mother in turn. And they're really worried about the effect on the child of doing that. So I find it it's, it's so admirable in such a sad and tragic way to see these alienated fathers not wanting to further harm their children by uh, introducing to their children the reality of the mother's lies, which is going to be devastating too, yes. but desperately wanting to reestablish the bond with the, the, the child or children whom they love so much. And, um, you know, it's, it's, and, you know, and then to see this kind of heartless, self-righteous tweeting by this Farrakhan, and there were others as well underneath Patrick Brown's tweet. Um, uh, like it, it's, it's one of these cases where you really see how asymmetrical the struggle between feminists and non-feminists, not men's rights uh, crazies, although there are men's rights advocates obviously involved in this struggle, but just ordinary fathers. Uh, I think that most fathers and most men's advocates indeed are just not willing to stoop this low. I've met many men and we've exactly. had conversations, you know, about like tactics in the gender war. And many men will say to me, even like men's issues advocates will say, I don't have a problem with female victims getting these special services, or I don't have a problem with acknowledging that women are more often the victims of sexual violence than men, you know, or whatever, like they'll say various things. I don't have a problem with this because they're interested in truth and they're decent and compassionate. So they'll concede a lot of ground in yes. this political war because they think it's fair to do so. Yes. Whereas you see somebody like Farrah Khan and her feminist allies, they never concede. They're not interested in truth. They see everything as a war to the death that should be fought regardless of what the truth actually is. And regardless if 
whether many children are being harmed in situations of parental alienation or not. She doesn't care about that. She only cares about controlling the narrative and empowering women to, uh, you know, exercise their will in cases of, of uh, court battles over custody or divorce or whatever. Uh, and, and so that's what makes it so difficult to know how to respond to this kind of thing, because I think most men's issues advocates aren't interested in stooping to that level, even though we're always painted as the violent ones, the liars, the abusers. <laughs> yeah. Plus, so, these men who've been literally crushed by their children turning on them, I mean, yeah. that's a point in time when it's really hard to take responsible action. You know, I mean, yeah. it's like you're, you're just wiped out. I see these guys just yeah. wiped out. I mean, just imagine, you know, the child you brought up is suddenly says, you know, you're a piece of dung. It's like, yeah. oh, God. Actually, that's a you really know, good what, point, what Tom. Oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I mean, that is the ultimate point. Like, I, I know men who've never recovered from... Yeah, they're I know, white. I know one man, you know, this happened to him 20 years ago. And he spent all his money and went to half a million dollars into debt to fight yeah. his ex-wife in court. He lost. Right. right. And he's never seen his children since then. Oh, and it God. just destroyed him. He lost his job as a result. He became an alcoholic. And yeah. I mean, he just his life was over and he never recovered. And, and people became impatient with him because he couldn't pull himself out of his despair. And, you know, that, and that's a pretty common thing. Yes. And, and people like Farrakhan will paint that man as an abuser. Right. Who is yeah. simply upset because he didn't get more access and you know this is a, a a narrative that we've seen from feminists actually for quite a while michael kimmel and crew back with the national organization of men against sexism and the other groups they formed they were originally the ones that uh, targeted father's rights activists as an abuser's lobby that was yes. the, the the term that they coined to describe yeah. them saying that the only reason that men would want more access to their children was so that they could continue to perpetrate abuse. Mm. Um, yeah. And, you know, there, as they always say, and I, what I say with the left all the time, whatever the left is accusing you of doing, that's what they're up to. Mm -hmm. And when you see feminists Same thing. out here trying to discredit parental alienation, what they want to do is perpetuate the, the, the ability toward this kind of abuse well, because I, they feel it gives women power. It's worth keeping in mind that the goal of feminism is to dissolve the family, yes. destroy yep. the family. And so this is really a great way to do it, whether it's no, men no, or no, women no, who are victims. And destroy fathers. Yeah. And destroy the family in general. I mean, yeah. that's, and uh, to make children to make children dysfunctional and dependent. Yeah. You know, dependent on the state. Indeed. Uh, depended on the feminist state. And yeah, it's... Uh, Janice mentioned that there were a thousand articles, and I think they're journal articles too, Janice, that have been written on parental alienation. So this is not mm -hmm. a topic that has been ignored, even though people like Farrah Khan will say, there's no research. Well, oh my gosh, there's a lot of research. In fact, you know, the, it used to be 10, 15 years ago that the research that was done was just descriptive. It says, well, it's, it looks like this and it looks like that. But they've gotten down now to where they're looking at different factors involved, like the five-factor uh, in um, idea about defining uh, parental alienation. Should we let's look at that just a second? Let's look at it. Let's yeah. see. I think those are the five factors there. The first is contact refusal. The child refuses to have contact with the alienated parent, and this is of course important. But it also assumes let's see if that's not another yeah positive relationship prior to contact refusal in other that's words right. they had a good relationship then all of a sudden something went haywire and there's no more desire to be connected and number three absence of abuse or neglect on the part of the alienated parent that's important i mean they're saying that this is not about abuse this doesn't have anything to do with abuse in fact if there's abuse involved it takes a different kind of of tack yeah. you know mm. Alienating behaviors of the preferred parent. Oh boy, and we'll list 17 of those in just a minute. And then child manifesting symptoms of parental alienation. So all of those have to be involved in order for parental alienation to be there. And the research has really gotten to the point where they're seeing these factors are the important pieces. 
So it's like they're getting someplace, even though people like Farrakhan will say, no, there's no research out there. That's bull crap. In fact, we're going to put up some PDFs in a minute that go over the main points. In fact, let's put one up right now, if you don't mind. And um, we will link you to these. Oh, we'll definitely have links to these guys. Um, there's one. Pearl alienation is real. And look at all the things that list there. But look very carefully at the small print. The small print gives you the study that cites that information that they, they give there. So this is really, really helpful stuff to read through. And to read the sites also. And, and we'll be happy to to put links to these. They're obviously done by a number of different organizations, including the National Parents Organization um, and others. So those are great stuff. Um, let's see. Do we want to put up the 17? <clears throat> the 17 the strategies? Look, yeah. Oh my goodness. These are just, they're hard to go through. Somebody want to look at them? Well, we don't need to go through them all, but uh, let's, I mean, I, many of these will be familiar to right. anybody who right. has uh, had a association with an alienated parent or has himself experienced this, this horrific form of abuse. Uh, bad mouthing, yeah. limiting contact, interfering with communication. I mean, that's a signal one. Interfering with symbolic communication, yes. withdrawal of love, telling the child targeted that the parent does not love him or her, forcing the child Evil. to choose. I mean, these are all, Evil. yeah, these are very familiar, but horrific strategies that the yes. alienating parent uses to turn yeah. the child against. I thought uh, 13. That last one, I think it, that you mentioned, Janice, is particularly egregious, and it's at the core of so much of this. Whether yes. it's spoken directly or not, there is pressure on the child from the alienating parent, in this case, many cases, the mother, to choose between the father and the mother. And the, the message and the subtext of forcing that choice is, of course, that if you choose to love your father, it means you're hurting me. Right. It yeah. means you don't love me. It means you're disloyal to me. And you will lose so in, me. In order for, for the, this child who has already effectively lost one parent from the home is now forced with the proposition that they're going to lose both parents unless yeah. they choose wisely. How do you expect a child to do anything but comply with that? It, 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 they're going to comply in most cases. It's why stomping alienating mothers is a very very difficult thing to do it, it's it's really hard yes. she has the power the courts are behind her society's behind her society would tell the man oh your daughter doesn't love you it's a face you'll get over it blah 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 uh you know whatever you do don't make a fuss but what i do like to tell men well i I'm, I'm not in favor of at all of dragging children into battles even when it's a situation like this where you're you're all but powerlessness powerless in the situation is that when you have a child that says mother told me that you didn't love me or since you got your new girlfriend that she's more important than i am it is really important for men to look their child directly in the eye and say that is not true exactly. i love you very much you are the most important thing in my life and let them fill in the blanks for themselves on if somebody's telling that that, that lie that they're in fact lying, yes. but it's real important. It, and that isn't dragging the child into the battle. It's just telling your child the truth about your feelings for them when they're being confronted with lies about that from the only other adult in their life. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Uh, scary thing. I mean, uh, the, the, the council for shared parenting basically ends by saying the, you know, the only thing we can do is just keep on trying to raise awareness about this and, uh, you know, uh, uh, addressing um, judges and lawyers, making them more aware about it, uh, making the general public more aware, pointing to all of the research that exists, showing that it is real. It's quite widespread. There are very clear diagnostic criteria. This is not merely a strategy of abusers, you know, quite the opposite. Uh, it's the alienation that is the strategy of abusers. And 
And I guess you know, we used to give putas and uh, hero awards. We kind of quit that. I don't know why. <laughs> but uh, in this case, I guess. So many uh, putas. <laughs> too many, too many options. It seemed yeah. like a, just a redundant award. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, in this case, I think we'd want to give the humanitarian award to those mayors who actually had the courage. Stood I don't know up. if they knew uh, what kind of backlash they were going to face. Maybe they won't do it again next year. I don't know. But, um, uh, you know, good for Patrick Brown. He was a yes. kind of disgraced uh, former leader of the provincial uh, conservative party. Um, huh. But anyway, he, yeah, he, he was pushed out of that that role. And it, he was accused, uh, falsely accused of, of sexual abuse. Uh, it turned out it was a complete lie. Couldn't possibly have been wow. true. But uh, it uh, certainly hurt his, his, his image. But he's managed to come back and is now... Uh, working as mayor uh, for for Brampton, so good for him and for the mayor of Mississauga for actually saying that uh, you know recognizing this is an important issue uh, that deserves that kind of official support. Good for them and and bad on the Farrakhans of the world who, knowing very yes. little about it, uh, just see an opportunity for a feminist smear job. So there are cracks in the feminist seal. You know, it's like Brown gives you that idea that, you know, suddenly there's cracks that are opening up. And if you look at the comments or the tweets underneath that one, some of them are positive. Some of them are saying, thank you, sir. You know, this is important information. So yeah. as a matter of fact, if we lived in a society that was capable of regarding women as adults with agency, we wouldn't even be having this discussion. Exactly. That, that, that's part of the problem is yes. that we can't see women as actors. Yes. And that goes across all political lines. Uh, yeah. It's why we have so much so-called conservative support for things like VAWA and what have you, <laughs> because there's just absolutely no tendency in human beings to hold women accountable for their behavior. And of course, we pay women like Farrah Khan big money to get out there and make sure women are not held accountable for yeah. their behavior. Yes. That's what she does for a living, more and than we're anything else. Also, unable to see men as needing compassion. Mm -hmm. Right. You put those two together, you got gynocentrism just pouring out through the heavens. Ugh. And children drown in it. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. That's the most ironic thing to me about all this, you know, rush to protect women is we rush to protect women mindlessly and we do it with such fervor that we steamroll right over children in the process yeah. because it. we're allegedly help, trying to help those who are, don't have power. It's yeah. crazy. We're stepping on the really powerless uh, players in this story yes. and crushing them mm -hmm. beneath the weight of our own hypocrisy by rushing to women's aid when the, we need to rush to hold them to account. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the things that Patrick Brown mentioned in his tweet, that it's really, this is about children. This is not about women per se. This is about children who are powerless and voiceless and who should be our primary concern yeah. <clears throat> but alas that is not the world we live in no. so children are not the primary concern women no. it's women first and women yeah. only oh yeah. boy and if the child gets in the way it'll be destroyed yeah hmm. it does seem like that's the case oh such is the lot for women in this world what can i say Ending on a sad note. No, uh -huh. we were going to end on a well, positive note. What's that? <laughs> Men are are. <laughs> good, 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 good. <laughs> oh god! Men are good. <laughs> they are. All of them. Pink Floyd. <laughs> yeah, really. I'll go along with that. Are we finished? We are finished for today. Good. We'll see you all next week. Have a great Take week. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.